Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Cedric Geffen. I'm the president of March of the Living Australia, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to what I'm sure will be another riveting presentation in this March of the Living Australia's 18th online event this year. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we work and live and on which this online event is being hosted today. We pay our respects to indigenous elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. Whilst the Holocaust is widely recognized as the world's greatest crime against humanity, and the, excuse the term, quintessential genocide, it is sadly evident that despite all efforts and hope that it will serve as the genocide to stop all future genocides, the reality is that numerous other genocides have taken place since the Holocaust. Our task and mission as a force for good in the world is therefore not over. It is incumbent on us to continuously enhance our knowledge and to raise our voices and act in the name of social justice, human rights, and stand up against discrimination, bigotry, hate, persecution, or worse. We have the privilege this evening to hear from an expert in her field, a distinguished historian, educator, and specialist in Holocaust and genocide studies, Tully Nates, founder and executive director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center a much loved and respected educator on the Adult March of the Living program, who later on will be joined by Dean Leviton, social justice act activist, current chair of Stand Up, graduate of the Australian Student March and founder of Yagid, Youth Against Genocide in Darfur. Tully will begin her presentation shortly and thereafter, Dean will briefly describe his experiences with Yagid. This will be followed by a Q&A session where we would love you to engage with the speakers. And now with further, without further ado, it's over to Tali. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cedric, in March of the Living Australia. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with so many friends, uh, friends of years. Uh, and I see, I see many of you uh, or and my warm, warm greetings from uh, more in Johannesburg. <laughs> so um, we had uh, experienced uh, a lot of load shedding lately. Uh, what is load shedding is when your government basically thinks that you are voluntarily giving your electricity away, you are not. But uh, for the whole last 10 days, we, um, we experienced that and it messed up our internet quite badly. So please forgive me if it is coming a little bit in and out. I will sometimes have to switch off my video, uh, but I'm sure that we'll, we are in a family, so we will be okay. I'm also very happy to share my PowerPoint and videos after that. Cedric, meanwhile, you can hear me? All okay? I hope? Okay. Please let me know if there is a problem. Okay, great, wonderful. So, you started by sharing um, this very moving video about March of the Living, going to Poland, the never again that of course happened again and again after 1945. I almost wish that I could take all of you uh, to Rwanda. I know that some of you uh, have visited, I see Sue here uh, that went many times, but, uh, and a few others, but um, Rwanda can also really teach us so much about, about uh, resilience, about hope, about rebuilding. And uh, it's a beautiful country, which uh, I will try to do justice to through the story of uh, the history, the painful history 
27 years ago. And on the 7th of April of this year, we actually marked 27 years since the start of the genocide in Rwanda. And this genocide, like all genocides, was a deliberate, intentional, and systematic mass killing. Uh, it targeted the Tutsi of the country. And uh, in that genocide that lasted about 100 days, three months from uh, April to July of 1994, approximately 1 million, mainly Tutsi, but also politically moderate Hutu, also Twa, uh, that were targeted men, women, and children. They were all murdered, some face to face, some by bullets, some by fire. During the, the, the time that we'll have together, I will try to share with you uh, some historical videos as well as some uh, films describing what happened in Rwanda through the eyes of the survivors, those that witnessed, that can tell us the stories themselves. Let me start by sharing a PowerPoint um, and uh, All right. In 2004, I visited Rwanda for the first time. Since then, I visited it dozens and dozens of times. But that first visit in one of the memorial sites today, the church, the Roman Catholic Church of Narama, um, will stay with me forever. You can see here the handwritten sign never again. You can see the, uh, the destruction of the church, the remains of the people that were murdered there. Almost 4,000 men, women, and children were murdered in that very small Catholic church. And I will never forget uh, the, my, my, my visit there because I was with a survivor uh, that was driving me around, his name was Kokos, and he had a huge machete scar on his head, very visible. That day, he was very upset because that morning, we started at the Kigali Genocide Memorial, which is a museum that opened that year in 2004, but also is the resting place of, uh, in mass graves, huge mass graves of 250,000 people. And, uh, all are in mass graves, and uh, there, Coco's parents and all his family are buried. So he's really upset. He sat outside of Narama, of the church, and uh, his head was down. And uh, I came to him and sat next to him and held his hands and uh, said that I'm sorry, because what do you say? You know, there are no words to describe it. And I told him that actually my family was also murdered in another genocide many years ago, and uh, that uh, um, it was my grandmother, it was my aunts, it was the rest of the family, and uh, that that genocide happened in Europe. And uh, yeah, my family was white. And yes, the killers of my family were white, and they looked the same, and they killed them. And Coco's eyes opened wide because he could not believe it. And he, you know, held my hands even stronger. And he said that he's so sorry. And uh, he also could not understand how the genocide in Rwanda happened after the world witnessed what happened in Europe. He said, surely they learned, but they didn't. So this is my father and my uncle, my father Moses Turner, my uncle Henrik Turner, um, they survived the Holocaust. My, my father survived four concentration camps and uh, him and my uncle were saved by Oskar Schindler. They were on uh, the famous Schindler's list, as many of you know, because you came with me to Poland and we went to Krakow and to Plaszow where my father was. 
They survived, but my grandmother, Lea, my aunts, Helen and, and Sila, didn't. The rest of the family, grandparents from all sides, uncles, cousins, did not. And throughout my childhood, I learned from my father that one to have choices. And he always said, not all Germans were bad because his life was saved by Oskar Schindler. And he said, you cannot put people in a box because not all Germans were bad, not all Nigerians are that, not all uh, Americans are that, not all you know, South Africans are that. And I learned from a very young age the uh, value of choices. In April of 1994, I joined millions of South Africans in our first April 1994, two countries in Africa, one voting for Nelson Mandela in a new democracy. I'm standing in lines and voted only at 9.30, 10 o'clock that night because there were such long lines. Um, in Rwanda already tens of thousands. If father about choices, yet I did not make the connection in real time. I stood and was happy that South Africa is peaceful, that we are okay, and I did not make the connection. Only weeks later, months later, I realized that another genocide had happened in my doorstep, three and a half hours flight away from South Africa. So we need to make the connections faster. We need to make historical connections quicker. We, may, we have to make choices. So I think that where it's really important for me is the issue of choices. So even though we are all connected to the Holocaust, my question to us is, do we make the connections quickly enough? And do we act when we see other terrible mass atrocities and genocides happening in other parts of the world. Because for me, a lot of us are saying, where was the world during the Holocaust? This is something I said, this is something all of us are saying. And then my question to myself, I, I cannot tell it to you, but my, my question to myself was, if I couldn't make the connections in real time, what do I need to make the connection? So what do I need to transform history into lessons for humanity uh, that are relevant to me, to my society, to my children today? And I think the history of Rwanda um, is extremely relevant because it is inspiring. It is, uh, yeah, it is difficult. There are haunting stories of individuals, of communities, of, of uh, um, you know, of, of, of people during that time. Uh, but I think that it can teach us uh, so much about moral choices and about consequences, including consequences of keeping quiet. So um, what I want to do is try to um, share my PowerPoint again. You tell me if it works. I don't mind to switch off my video if uh, that helps. So let's see if it works because I would like to show you some pictures and videos from, um, from the voices of the Rwandans. Now, when we speak about choices, uh, I said to you that I'm coming from Johannesburg and one of the choices we made in Johannesburg when I created the, the center because I'm the founder of uh, this beautiful award-winning uh, center is to concentrate on genocides in the 20th century. So we opened it only in 
uh, in March 2019. It is open now. Um, and uh, we decided to get uh, examples from the continent. So we, we are looking at Namibia, we're looking at Rwanda, and we're looking also at Asia, uh, Cambodia, Armenia, and of course, the Holocaust. With the Holocaust in Rwanda is our main case study. What was really important for us is to put the Neve again in. You saw the Neve again on the bones in my first picture. But the important thing for us was to put the Neve again with a question mark because it's not Neve again. Yes, the world after the Holocaust said Neve again, but it is not. And then what we wanted to do is to look at um, the voices of witnesses, to look at the voices of victims, of perpetrators, of resistors, of rescuers, of bystanders, and of others, and to look at dilemmas and choices that um, will help us to make connections to uh, to, to this history. So um, actually, survivors started to talk very late and that is similar to Holocaust survivors. For all of few second generation, you know that parents did not speak many times until after Eichmann trial in the 1960s, sometimes even later than that. So 20 years, 30 years, and the Tutsi survivors also did not speak for more than 20 years. Some of them started to speak uh, about five, six, seven years ago. And we were fortunate to um, record some testimonies. Uh, and um, these are the testimonies that I'm going to share with you today. So those were important for us because we wanted to make the connections to South Africa. And I'm going to share with you some of those voices mainly of survivors, but also of resistors, rescuers, bystanders, and uh, perpetrators. So I will start with the story of neighbors, neighbors that helped in a time of great need. And we will look at the courage and the innovation that was needed to save a life, and of course, to save a family, uh, and uh, of course, to stay alive. And for those of you that, are, that know the history of the Holocaust very well, you will see the similarities. You will see how you needed the neighbors to, to say, you know, to, to, to help you. So I would start with this story, the story of Emmanuel Mwezi. Uh, Emmanuel's father was killed uh, when the civil war started in 1990. Let me give you a little bit of history. So, um, the colonial powers in Rwanda were first Germany and then Belgium. And then before Belgium gave independence to Rwanda, the uh, Hutu majority, um, and, and I don't have time to go into all the complex history of, of Rwanda, but ask me during the questions and I'm very happy to go into it. But uh, when Belgium wanted to give independence to Rwanda, the Hutu majority, uh, and the, the country was 85% Hutu, about 14% uh, Tutsi, and 1% Tua. Uh, the Hutu majority uh, started uh, a, a really, uh, a, a, what you can say, massacres and mass atrocities against the Tutsi. Many of them were driven into exile in 1959, before independence, independence in 1962. And uh, Emmanuel's father and mother were pushed into exile, but decided that they cannot live in exile and returned to Rwanda. Emmanuel's father was killed in 1990 when uh, the Tutsi minority formed a, an army in Uganda and the former Zaire called the Rwandan Patriotic Front. And they tried to come back to Rwanda and bring the exiles back into Rwanda. A civil war started in 1990 and Emmanuel's father was targeted and killed because he was an unspoken community leader. And the people, the neighbors uh, saw him as a threat and killed him. Now, during the genocide, Emmanuel's mother and 13 of the 14 siblings survived. And that is a miracle. That did not happen a lot. And why did it happen? Because of a Hutu neighbor and his family. 
His sister, by the way, and her unborn child were tragically murdered. And Emmanuel, by the way, now is married with a beautiful baby girl. Uh, he used to live in Johannesburg where he studied. That's where we interviewed him. He lives back in Rwanda today and does amazing work. And Emmanuel said, I was saved by a Hutu. That's my life. And if there are people who say, no, maybe he did help you, but he wanted to kill other people, that's not up to me to judge. If that guy was not there at the time he came right now, I will be in some memorial. And that is the reality. So let's listen, and I'm going to switch off my video, uh, but let's listen to Emmanuel speaking about his experience. Me, my brother Bernard, and Jeff, we went down to the lake because we, as we said we shouldn't hide in the, in the same place. Because maybe if they find one, they might kill one, and the others will survive. of them so we decided to go on top of the, of the tree down they went into the lake so now we could see this where they were swimming the, the, their destination now it's seven o'clock the sun is out which means the, the killers are out also because in the morning that's when you could hear uh, the screaming, the chasing, the dogs. I had a friend, we didn't even know he was hiding not far from there. So we saw him, they found him, dogs. That boy was not really a good swimmer, so he jumped into the water, he tried to swim, but they came, they had guns, they shot, they shot him. He was in my class, I remember him. That day, that's when I was like, okay. This is real. Because that was the first time I could, I saw, I saw someone being just killed in front of me. Uh, but I couldn't, yeah, nothing could just keep quiet. Pray that they don't find you. These films are part of our permanent exhibition at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. We also use them for education and they were done by Adam Mazo, a very talented uh, director. Now I want to move to strangers that saved, because also in the Holocaust, we know that many times it took strangers to save the lives. Um, and the same was in Rwanda. Uh, and that is the story of uh, Sylvester Sendakeye. He lives in South Africa. He actually came for medical treatment uh, because he was severely wounded uh, during the genocide. And uh, he met uh, his wife here in, he built a family, he has four children, and he volunteers at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center sharing his story. Uh, his parents, his siblings were murdered uh, in the genocide and uh, he was saved by a German nun. Uh, and he says there was a German nun at the church, Milgita Kosa. Not many of them stayed, but she did. She wanted to help us. And uh, he survived and then he discovered 
after through the United Nations that uh, two of his brothers also survived. And uh, that was a real miracle. He's a wonderful, wonderful human being that uh, um, is still traumatized by, by the event. I will share with you his testimony now. Rwandan people believe that in the church, no one should attack a church. And whoever was there had to be safe. Attacking church is like attacking God. In the morning, we hear bomb, bomb, bomb everywhere. So now we've been, we've been attacked. And what was it, the difference? There were cows. The cow is a photo of you, and then it, you throw, you throw, you throw stone. It comes to time whereby the cows run away. Now it's a, it's a war face to face. So they hit me at the, at the back everywhere and here. But then, uh, let me tell you that uh, the memory when you know that you're going to die, I think you don't, there's no pains. My, my, my soul was gone, my spirit was gone. What was there was just a body. I never feel anything, but I remember when they hit me here. I, I told myself, you know what, if they hit me again, I'm gone. But the fact that the too much blood was out, they were just seeing blood only. They thought, oh, we're done with this one. Yeah, it's, it's dead. The morning, they are coming to bury us. Or oh, they are coming to check who is still alive. I ran away. This uh, Catholic sister, one, the one who was from Germany, was having a medical center. She used to bribe, keep on bribing people always that they must not kill us. So he, you have here choices of resistance. His father was one of the organizers of the resistance, um, using the cows to protect them. Uh, but sadly, most were murdered in the church. Agnes' story is a very painful one because Agnes was a Hutu who married the Tutsi and had six children. According to Rwandan tradition, the children go according to the father. And because the husband was Tutsi, the children were regarded as Tutsi. And she uh, lost three of her six children and her husband. She herself was raped. And uh, her perpetrator, one of her perpetrators, Alexander, uh, testified in front of the gachacha. Again, I don't have much time to speak about it now, but perhaps we can speak about it in question time, uh, because after the genocide, there was a, a, a justice system, and the gachacha allowed many survivors to confront uh, their perpetrators. Alexander, uh, conf uh, uh, he, he shared who were the other perpetrators. He himself was a young youth, he was involved in destroying Agnes's house. He did not kill her family, but he told who did. And uh, after he was released, uh, after the gachacha, he um, helped her to build her house and to, uh, to work her fields. And uh, they are today quite, very, quite close. And Agnes is saying, I have to be strong so that I may forgive, so that I may continue living. The strength allows me to take care of orphans because now we are the women and the men of our families. We are parents of diverse families, parents of Rwandan families. And this is her choice and Alexander's choice to work together uh, with her three children that remained alive. I want to move to a very moving story, the story of the only American that decided to stay in Rwanda. Uh, Carl Wilkins, um, very, very wonderful, wonderful hu uh, human being. He was then the director of the Rwandan Adventist Development and Relief Agency International of the Seven-Day Adventist Church. Um, and uh, as the only American that stayed, he actually managed to help the Damascus Simba, 
the head, the Hutu head of the, one of the orphanages in Kigali to save all the orphans and parents, more than 400 of them uh, from the orphanage in Kigali. Uh, he, by the way, Carl made sure that his wife, children and parents left Rwanda. He didn't ris risk their life, but he decided to stay. And uh, when he saved the 400, he did it in a very unique way. He saw the militia led by this man that you see in the picture, Gregoire. Gre Gregoire was the head of the Hutu extremist militia, the entire Hamwe, that uh, surrounded the orphanage and wanted to kill all of them. And Carl begged Gregoire to give him time. He went out of the orphanage. He went directly to the prime minister of the time during the genocide, a genocide himself, uh, Jean Kambanda, and begged him to save the orphans. And uh, he said, fine, I will, I will do it. Strange, but you know, these things uh, sometimes happened. And uh, we can speak about, uh, you know, how a, a foreigner, an American maybe had a power more than a Rwandan. He pleaded uh, to save and it happened. So thanks to Wilkins and Gisimba, uh, the 400 uh, children and adults could go to a safer place in, Kigami, uh, in Kigali. By the way, Damas Gisimba said something that I put on the screen because for me, it's so powerful. Because he said, I was there trying to stop the militia from entering. They asked the children, to split to two groups, Hutu on one side and Tutsi on the other. But the children, as I always told them, they were one, they should be united. They did not want to separate and they did not. And Gisimba and Carl uh, not only saved their lives but gave them values that they carry until today. Now in 2019, Carl visited our center and in our exhibition, we have Gregoire in films and in, uh, in our exhibition. And um, Carl was so, um, you know, so shaken by seeing the picture of Gregoire and hearing him speak, I'm going to share with you in a minute. So he became very emotional and he shared with us how he had to come to terms with Gregoire's uh, guilt and choices and how he's still struggling with it, uh, but he's trying to see him as a human being. Listen to Gregoire's testimony. I do not see a whole group of people who are governing Oma. I am governing Oma. Urwego rw'ibanze mu mujyi wa Kigali nyo barase gitera inyakabanda nkaba rero nashishikarije abanyarwanda kwica abatutsi mu gihe cya genocide muri 1994 12 yonteganya ko nk'ibihumbi umunani cyangwa se cyenda baguye muri yo sagitere ntago nigize ngira uruhare mu kwica ariko mu gushishikariza abantu mu mu gutegura iyo gahunda yo kwica ndumva ari nje uri ku waburi ku isonga guko iyo nza kumera nko birwanya ndumva nta kiba cyarabaye mbere zaraje ndumva atari ibanga ubundi hariho gahunda yo kuvuga ko umututsa agiye kutwambura ubutegetse twebwe abahutu biba ngumbwa rero ko habaho ko na leta kuko imera nkidushyigikira kuko nta wigeze ahanirwa icyo kintu cyane cyane ko ibyo bintu bikoze nabitekereje nabigambiriye Guru ni jihanu ngomba kuchachira. Kuko waru yowe guvernuma, tufuge kwe ratu ya mochi ufu. Jina inu ya mwenyakawanda. Nesi hala ajia mherezi mbunda, mherezi mupanga, mherezi chi, chabute mwa mochi achuru tutura nyo. Icha hani gatozi kumunu. So a sin is personal, he says. And we have other perpetrators that blame it on the government, or said the elders told me to do it, or those that are saying, you know, it wasn't against the law, or what is very familiar to us in the Holocaust field, I just followed orders. 
Let's turn to the world, because the world played uh, a role of bystanders during the genocide. Uh, from the United Nations to the church, all churches, Catholic, Protestant, uh, evangelist, all of them, to countries um, like Australia or like South Africa, to countries in Africa, including South Africa that was busy voting Mandela and not caring about what is happening north of the border. And let's remember also that the United Nations was, was led by African leaders at that time. The head of the United Nations was Boutros Boutros Ghali from Egypt. The head of the peacekeeping force was Kofi Annan from Ghana. So I'm living in Africa, I really care about the fact that we kept silent. Uh, in our exhibition, we quote Philippe Galliard, the head of the Red Cross in Rwanda that said, Everybody knew, every day, live, what was happening. Who moved? Nobody. And uh, what I'm going to do is to share with you a video from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum that allowed us to edit this video of Romeo Delay. Romeo Delay, a Canadian general that was the head of the peacekeeping forces of the United Nations at the time, that came to keep the peace, but then the genocide started. And uh, listen to him describing the role of the world in the bystanders. Canadian General Romeo Dallaire witnessed the genocide as commander of a small UN peacekeeping force stationed in Rwanda. In June 2002, he spoke at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum about how the genocide might have been prevented and about his own struggle with the memory of failing to do so. You can't just say, well, it's eight years ago or nine years ago and you did what you could. Um, did I do everything I could? Did I have all the tools? In the middle of this horror were General Dallaire and the poorly equipped UN force sent to keep a peace that the extremists had suddenly, violently shattered. You have no food, water, fuel, medical supplies, defensive stores, because none of the contracts had been signed six months into the mission by the UN staff. Countries had not provided troops with equipment, so you got uh, Bangladeshi troops coming in would not even a pot to be able to cook their food. Three months before the genocide began, General Dallaire had learned of extremist plans for mass murder and told his UN superiors that he was going to seize an arms cache. The response was immediate, within hours, that uh, I was not authorized, it was outside my mandate, uh, and that I was jeopardizing the whole mission. Well, on the 6th of uh, April, uh, the war started, Within 24 hours, I had 10 soldiers dead, but already thousands of Rwandans were being slaughtered. After the killing started, General Dallaire requested more forces to stop the murders. Within the first few days of the Rwandan war and genocide, Kofi Annan went to all 69 countries. Not one of them provided one soldier. Although no nation would send troops to help the Rwandans, Western soldiers did arrive to evacuate Westerners. And so all the expatriates within five days picked up what they had, left the Rwandans who had served them for years, decades, who raised their kids, left them to be slaughtered behind and went back to Brussels and Paris and all these other places. The world turned its back on Rwanda. Two weeks into the genocide, the UN Security Council voted to reduce Dallaire's force to a token level. General Dallaire left Rwanda in August 1994. He still struggles with the memory of what he witnessed. You just can't walk through with all that blood and all that gore and all that sound. Did I or should I have walked up to Kofi Annan or Butos Ghali? and throw my commission in front of him and say, to hell with you, nobody's coming, so I'm going. Should I have commenced opening fire? 
the first morning, it was made very clear to me that if I opened fire, I would become the third belligerent because then it's open season. But with the force I had, there was no way that I could open fire and guarantee the security of my force. I didn't have enough ammunition to be able to hold out in a firefight for more than half an hour. No, there is no conceivable way of actually being able to walk away uh, from the immensity of what it is. This is not four or five people on a block. This is thousands upon thousands upon weeks and weeks and weeks. And the Western world sat there. You've got to start wondering about the depth of your belief in the moral values, the ethical values, and your belief in humanity. All humans are human. There are no humans more human than others. That's it. All humans are humans. There is no human more human than other. I think these are the most important words. If you came today and you want to remember just those words and live by them, I think for me, it's the most important words that, that can be said um, about, about ourselves, uh, about prevention. So how does Rwanda heal after such catastrophe? How do they seek justice? How do they build memorials? How do they educate? How do they rebuild the houses, the, the, the roads? It, it's impossible. And we all know Europe after 1945, how long it took to rebuild. For me, the words of Fatuma, that was the executive secretary of, national, of the National Unity and Reconciliation Commission until 2009, are very, very important because she's saying our policy is unity and reconciliation, accommodating everybody, including the perpetrators. Killers have to live side by side with victims after the 1994 genocide. We cannot have a land of victims and a land of perpetrators. Despite whatever happened, they have to live side by side. And that is a big difference. Uh, between what happened in Rwanda, where everyone lives side by side. Yes, about 200,000 perpetrators were arrested. They were in jail. There was a whole process of amnesties and, and, and gachacha and trials to get them out. But still, they have to live together. They have one country. After the Holocaust, many of the survivors left. That is a big difference. So today, 27 years later, you know, Rwanda is rebuilding and is, you know, a country, as I started to say, that is very much worth traveling to. It's beautiful, it's safe, and you can learn a lot about human behavior in that country. Um, I'm almost finished, but I want to speak about speaking again, because I said to you that survivors did not speak for a long time, but now the memorials are there, the museums are there, it's part of the education system. And the words of Antoinette are really, really important for me because she's reflecting why to tell the story. And it's very familiar again for those that worked with Holocaust survivors. And she says, I need to find the strength to tell my story. If I don't, it is like denying the genocide. If I, the only survivor of my family die without telling my history, it will die with me. The name of our family will disappear forever. I want my child to learn about our history. I don't want it to be hidden. So our role in society is to pay attention and listen to the stories and warnings of the survivors 
we meet and we do that with the Holocaust. Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel said, when you listen to a witness, you become a witness. And we know it from the March of the Living. And the same is with the Rwandan witnesses and survivors, because now that you heard them, you can carry on and tell the stories. And uh, finally, you know, learning about genocide and how it relates to us, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about that point again, can help us see how prejudice, discrimination, othering leads or can lead to mass atrocities and genocide. And we need to emphasize that because we need to become the voice against hate speech, against human rights violations, and you know, to work, work against preventing future uh, genocides, or you know, to work towards preventing future genocides. In the end of our exhibition, we have photos of two survivors, both volunteers at the center, Arin Klaas, a survivor from the lodge, uh, from lodge that was in the Warsaw Ghetto and then lived in hiding, and Sylvester, who you met before. And of course, you see that Irene thought that after the world saw what happened, it will never happen again, but it didn't. And uh, that never again that we spoke about was not their reality, and it is not their reality. So can we become activists for change? Can we uh, become those that um, can make by using memory, never again a reality in our lifetime. So I will stop here. I do hope that you did manage to see the videos and um, the PowerPoint, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tully. We, um, we certainly did see the videos and that powerful presentation, um, and I'm sure there's gonna be some uh, room for questions later on. Um, I'd like to, at this stage, um, shift gear and uh, move to Dean Leverton. Uh, Dean's joined us here this evening, and uh, without further ado, I introduced him at the beginning. He was at an engagement party, so joined us a little bit later. Um, but I'm going to ask Dean to um, jump into it straight away and tell you a little bit about his story um, and how it connects to this whole story, and then we'll have uh, some time for some questions. Thank, thanks, Cedric, and thank you all for being here. And I also want to thank Tully. That was an incredibly moving presentation. I won't take too long because um, I'm sure people have many questions for her, as I do. I just want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on the, the elders, past, present, and emerging. I'm, on the, I'm in Caulfield, which is the land of the Bunurong people and the Warung people of the East Kulin Nation. So I'd like to acknowledge them, the elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, my story in connection to, um, to this issue really began on March of Living. Um, it began, um, though not in Poland, it began actually at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. So for, you, for those of you who've been there, I think probably most of you have been, just follow, my, um, follow me as I talk you through my experience. Um, I was walking towards the exit of Yad Vashem, and if for those you, you can imagine, um, you walk to those through those big glass doors, and you open up into the big. You, you have this view of of um, beautiful Jerusalem. Before you exit those glass doors on the right hand side, there's a notebook, um, a guest book, where people can write their thoughts, feelings, emotions of um, their of what of what they're thinking about after their experience there. And um, I remember. Before going to write mine, I read, I read some of the messages on the page before me. And one message um, has stood out to me since then and still moves me today. And it was a message by a, a girl. Her name was Janie. Uh, she was nine years old. And she said five simple words. She said, why didn't anybody do anything? And I read those words and I get chills speaking about it even now because it was with this, the naivety and simplicity of a nine-year-old girl who was able to articulate really the essence of what we're all talking about here, which is indifference, which is about being a bystander. Um, listen to what Tully said tonight. I mean, and we all know this, but the, you know, the words of, of the late Ellie Wiesel, uh, indifference is the friend of the enemy, could not be more true. And it was clear to me at that moment when I read that message, 
I was I was shocked because I'd just gone from Poland, um, visiting concentration camps. I'd then gone to Yad Vashem and seen all of the, the testimonies from Yad Vashem. And then what stuck with me was this really basic question, which is just, why didn't anybody do anything? And the reason it shook me so much is because I knew intuitively, I knew from reading the news and things at the time, that there was a genocide going on in Darfur, in Sudan at that time. So here I was learning about a, a genocide that happened in the 60 years earlier and people, young girl asking of our generation, asking of that generation, why didn't anybody do anything? Knowing full well that I was living in a time where there was a genocide going on across the seas. And it terrified me to think that in 50, 60 years time, there'll be next generations of people asking those sorts of questions about me and my generation. Why didn't we do anything? Um, and I felt in that moment, incredibly responsible. I felt an, a, a, in, an aura of responsibility take over me that if I was prepared to criticize and question and, uh, and doubt the indifference of a generation of people in, in, in Europe in the 1940s, then how could I live with myself and not feel some responsibility for what was going on, mass atrocity and genocide in Darfur and Sudan? So when I returned from March of Living, um, I, with a couple of friends, set up an organization called Youth Against Genocide in Darfur, Yagid, which in Hebrew means he will tell. And we set up this movement of young people where we gathered in the Melbourne CBD and the city CBD protesting and writing letters to politicians and petitions. And I'm sure we didn't do very much at all by way of changing the mind of politicians. But as we heard from Tali tonight, it's once we, we, can't, we can't allow people to justify inaction through ignorance. So if we're able to educate and create awareness around an issue, then at least we create an environment where people acknowledge that they have some responsibility because they can't say they didn't know about it. And so we found this organization, we had hundreds, if not thousands of young people engaged in this issue of tackling injustice and genocide in a country that could not be further away in Sudan. And that really inspired me and motivated me to see what young people could do. Um, I went on and uh, after school, I joined Stand Up, then Jewish Aid as the campaign director and ran um, the Sudan Peace Project, again, petitioning and creating awareness around the issue of um, the genocide in Darfur, uh, and uh, I continue to be involved in Stand Up Today, but really all motivated by that idea that indifference is the enemy and, um, and being proactive, taking responsibility and doing what we can when we can um, is how we fulfill our moral obligation. Fantastic, Dean. Uh, you're a true inspiration and uh, I thank you for that. Um, I'd like to uh, ask, there haven't been any questions that have come through on the chat. So if there is anyone who would like to uh, ask a question of Tully or of Dean, um, what I would suggest is, uh, because you are muted, if you can possibly put up your hand um, or send a message quickly and um, we'll take one or two questions and then uh, draw to a close. So if there's anyone who would like to pose a question, uh, please come forward. Yes, I see a question from Innocent. Um, Matan, can you unmute Innocent, please? Thank you. Welcome, Innocent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, actually, I used my husband's computer and it, it, it appeared like his name. Yeah, but uh, um, my name is Chantal. Oh, sorry. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was very sorry when I came and I just found his name. I say, oh my God, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. um, I'm original from Rwanda and uh, um, I was listening like a uh, all things happening there, and um, 
uh, thank you, Tali, to share with us. Yeah, and uh, my question is like, um, um, I have like, a, I'm like a, from like a mixed family and uh, um, I'm original, like I'm a Hutu because my father is a Hutu, like how Tali explained. And uh, um, I was very sad because like when I hear the story and uh, I see like what happened in Rwanda and uh, I was there and uh, I see everything. And uh, when they say that uh, um, the gen is uh, like a Tutsi genocide, to be, happy, to be honest, it happened like they killed Tutsi uh, when it happened like the first time. But uh, also there is uh, too many Hutus died inside. If you can see how much in my family died and uh, my, even my friends died, it's very sad. Then when they say the Tutsi genocide, um, I, uh, uh, I don't like uh, feel it. I feel very sad to other side, to Hutu side. And uh, my, um, I don't maybe want to say too many things. The only like what I'm asking a tally, is that uh, if you please, they can you go to both sides because both sides they lose uh, many people. Even you like uh, not even at that time. After that time, uh, we ran away. We ran away because like uh, um, the Tutsi army, F uh, RPF army was killing many people, and then we ran away. When we ran away, they follow everywhere people they run. They go in a refugee camp, they go where they call Kibeho. If you open what happened in Kibeho, in a refugee camp, and there was a lying that inside there was the army, and it was just a lie. And when, until now, when we see too many lies, I'm every day crying, and I say, what, what is happening in my country? And I'm just praying for that maybe God will open everything, and maybe people, in the world, they can see all things happen. Yeah, yeah. it's too many things to say, but you can't finish everything. Yeah, only like my asking, please, if you can go and ask like both sides, ask who to people, ask to the people what happened. And also you, you can see that a general, Dalel, he was there and they call the United Nations to send the army and they refused to send the, the RPF, uh, the Tutsi the army, say that they don't want the army to come inside to stop like the killing. Why they refuse like army people to come inside? And when you see it is too much political things, it is too many planned things. And sometimes I say, oh, even when I remember, sometimes I sit down. Every Rwanda and it became like a crazy. We got a too many trauma. Yeah, we got, I don't know what I can say. Um, yeah. very sorry, but please. Oh. Um, yeah. yeah, Chantal, I, I hear you. I hear you. The trauma is, is terrible, absolutely terrible. I do hear you. Um, what I tried to explain, I, I stopped in 1994. I did not really go further into this very complex history. But as I said, uh, and I gave many, many examples where, uh, first of all, Hutu were targeted. Agnes was raped. She was, uh, she, she received uh, um, sadly sexual transmitted disease. I can tell you much more about that. I just don't have time to speak about all the rape of Hutu women. Uh, sadly, then there was certainly uh, suffering on all sides, there is no doubt. It is a complex history. And what I did, I put in the uh, chat two publications that we, um, we published this year. One, the second publication, it's called Portraits of Survival. And uh, uh, the second publication, the volume two, is Portraits of Rwandans who survived. And amongst them are Hutu and Tutsi, Chantal. So you will sadly see a story similar to yours of someone that went to Zaire and in the jungles, you know, and, 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 and the pain and trauma. Um, so today I just chose to tell you just about the 100 days. 
where there is no doubt that the Tutsi were the targeted group. There is no doubt about it. All history yes, less. Yes, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But also, but it is complex. Yes, it is yeah, complex. There's something also I heard like that it things it started like in 1959. If yes, you can absolutely. see what was happening between one and uh, 1959, how like the Tutsi was treating the Hutu, yeah. then now you can have a picture what all of things happen. And I uh, think just Chantal, if I may, if I may, yeah. I'm just going to try and um, divert the discussion because I think the point that you've made is very valid, that there's always two sides to the story. Um, I think that um, Tully gave a fair enough presentation and I'd like to pass on to the next uh, question and that is a question from Noel. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Cedric. First of all, uh, I want to thank Tali for uh, this, uh, you know, presentation. Uh, it's really good to see that people like you are very interested in the history of Rwanda. I'm originally from Rwanda, and now I'm of course Australia, based in Sydney. Uh, most of my question actually was uh, similar to Shantan. Yes, we understand what happened to Rwanda. To uh, we. And like 99% of the ones who are living in Rwanda uh, have lost at least someone or a relative or a neighbor. And there's a problem in Rwanda saying a friend can be better than a neighbor, your own people. So, uh, so Tali, you used a term saying the history of Rwanda uh, made relevant, also made teachers moral choices and consequences of keeping you quiet. And when you look at what happened, the world was closing its eyes. Uh, the international community didn't want to intervene. And of course, uh, specifically, there was more intentions from both sides. So in that area, so when you look at uh, the lessons uh, we learned from, uh, so what I want to say, it's, it's just, one of the cases you used, you were showing how like a perpetrator and the victims were uh, the victims, how they were being targeted, the perpetrators, how they acknowledged what they have done. But and somehow, so with the research you did, do you think what happened in Rwanda has thought as a lesson where what happened in 1994 may not occur again? Because there's some signs showing you that what happened in 1994, I know you, you wanted to cover just 1994, uh, which is which I understand, but if what happened in 1994 was a big lesson, not only to one, it's also to the international community, was it, so do you think we have the one government or the people for one international community have learned enough lessons for what happened to us will never happen again? Because as Shanta said, beyond 1994, there was another massive killings, even before Joseph, there was another mass killings. Mm -hmm. So what can we do as human? You say, there's someone who said all humans are humans. There's no human than other, the other human. So what can we do to avoid that? Also, what can also international community or people like you, like Dean was saying, thank you again for incredible work. What can we do to make sure whoever is part of these things is, is held accountable? For example, especially the dictatorship regime in Africa, you know what the dictatorship regime does in Africa. What can we do? So can, what mm. can you do all of us? to avoid this, to, to make sure yeah. this never happen again? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. And Dean, please do come after me because uh, your view will be really, really important. There's no doubt that those words are not a reality yet, Noel. And, uh, uh, you know, there are so many conflicts. I, I'll, just mention your region, you know, the Australian sort of region. If you look at Myanmar, Burma, what is happening uh, there at the moment with the coup in February, but before that with the, the Rohingya situation, two million refugees are in Bangladesh from, uh, from, from Myanmar. So, so there is definitely, definitely never again is not a reality. Let's, let's just put that on the table. And uh, not only in Africa, but uh, in Asia and uh, in many, many other areas. And uh, that is, uh, terrible. It's actually terrible. But let's let's just concentrate on some good. Some some. Let, let's give ourselves in the evening that you'll not go to sleep and think, oh, the world is a terrible place. Let's go and live in Mars, you know, because 
<laughs> you know, what can we do here? So I think that lessons, some lessons were learned by the international community. And I'll give you one such lesson that I believe was learned. Um, and that is that um, we all have a responsibility and uh, the, the act that passed in 2005 uh, the Act on Responsibility to Protect, passed at the United Nations, signed by dozens and dozens and dozens of governments, and enacted. So I'll give you two good examples, because we only spoke about bad examples. In Kenya, before the election, there was a worry that there will be massacres and maybe genocides. Because of the responsibility to protect, that was prevented, and a peaceful solution was found. The same in Cote d'Ivoire, in Ivory Coast. The same in the Gambia. There was a dictator there for 22 years. The countries in the area of West Africa managed to move him out and install a democratic government. I'm just giving you examples from Africa because Africa is, you know, I, I know Africa better than I know Asia. But um, I think that we do need to remember that on a global level, but more, and Dean, I will ask you to come in here on a personal level, we need to act. So we need to hold our governments um, to account, write to your prime minister, write to your, you know, to your members of, uh, you know, that were chosen uh, and, and when you see something that you're worried about and act. Build a museum, speak also about current issues. Don't stay in 1945. You know, you can't, you can't afford to stay in 1945, even in March of the Living. Thank you, Cedric, for inviting me because I am a Holocaust scholar, but I cannot stop in 1945. I need to learn the lessons after that. So uh, um, that is me, Dean. Oh yeah, I definitely agree uh, that never again is not a right reality. It's, it, it's, you know, let's all accept it's an aspiration. It's not a, um, we don't live it. Um, it's we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, speak about it as though it is because it's to delude um, the entire reality. What we should do is we should look at it as an aspirational future. Um, and some of the ways that we can do that, and I, I agree that there are glimmers of hope around the world. On a really personal level, for example, here in Australia, we need to realise that. Australian governments helping an oppressed minority in Africa is not going to be in the self-interest of the Australian government unless enough people in the community show that the government will lose votes at an election or will lose some kind of community goodwill if they don't do what's morally right. And so that's where we all come in because our job is to educate each other and educate the rest of the community and make it uh, an important touchstone issue for enough people that enough people change their minds and vote for people who will do the right thing by oppressed minorities. We look at, for example, um, refugees and asylum seekers. And if you want to look at Australia's policy on asylum seekers, you need to realise that it's not in Australia's self-interest to, to um, to be letting in refugees from everywhere, but we can change. We we can we can change the minds and and policies of of politicians if we get enough people to change their vote. And we've seen that happen in recent elections. But that's why it's so important that each of us do the right thing to make sure that we can influence elections in that way. Ladies and gentlemen, time is uh, is unfortunately running away from us. I think we could continue on this topic of how do we take the lessons of the past and prevent uh, similar actions happening in the future or in the present. Uh, this is something which we battle with on a daily basis, I believe, and should be front in mind of uh, our consciousness on a day-to-day -day level. I'm going to ask my friend and colleague, Shirley Atlas, uh, to pose a vote of thanks. So over to Shirley, thank you. Oh, okay. 
Okay, first of all, Tully, thank you so much, really, for doing this for us tonight. I especially thank you because I know you did this for International March of the Living in South Africa on Thursday, which for Australia, of course, was totally the wrong time. So we really appreciate you doing this again for us and the most amazing presentation that you gave us today. Um, Tully, you are an absolute legend. You are an, an educator extraordinaire. You are an inspiration to everybody. From a personal perspective, I've known you many years from meeting you in Poland, from when you came to Perth, from me visiting you at the, your museum and having wonderfully guided tours of your amazing facility. Um, really, you, you really are an incredible, amazing person. Because of you and Sue Hample, I actually decided to go to Rwanda myself in 2014. Um, and that was for me was another amazing journey after educating about the Holocaust. While I was shocked and saddened by all the sights that you showed tonight, hearing stories of survivors, which by the way, was very strange meeting survivors younger than me, where all the Holocaust survivors are obviously all in the 80s and 90s. Um, while I was shocked by all of that, I was inspired by the policy of the Rwandan government with this reconciliation, renewal, um, reunion, which was quite amazing for a country that was so destroyed and so broken to actually heal. So that was quite incredible in itself. Um, we can't really compare genocides, but as you told us, there are similarities definitely between the two. Um, the stories you told us tonight of the choices people make, the perpetrators, the bystanders, the rescuers, the crimes against humanity, all of those I think do resonate with everybody. Tully, you said that we, we have to be the voice against discrimination, against senseless hatred, against any kind of injustice. And Dean, you are you definitely embody that, amazing. As an educator on Master of the Living, I see so many students come back fired up with this notion of never again and what can we do, but you have done it. You really are amazing what you have achieved at your young age with stand up with um, um, Yagir, Yagur, quite incredible what you have done. So. And, to, and you still are, you still are showing us that each and every one of us does have the choice. We can make a difference. We just need to put our minds to it. So Tully and Dean, thank you so much for an amazing presentation, amazing evening. And I think it's something we can all take with us. So thanks again and good night. Thank you so much, uh, Shirley. I'd just like to end off by um, just reminding everyone that uh, March of the Living's global campaign, Let There Be Light in Commemoration of Kristallnacht, um, is taking place at the moment. If you go to kristallnacht.motl.org and uh, join the voices of so many to make the world a better place, there'll be a global educational program commemorating Kristallnacht on Wednesday, the 10th of November, that we broadcast at 11 a.m., and rounding off our November activities will be another incredible talk with Dr. Leon Chamidis, a survivor from Canada who was saved by the Metropolitan Sheptitsky in Lvov, as a follow-up to the incredible earlier event on the theme of Righteous Among the Nations that we held a month ago. This will take place at 10 a.m. on Sunday the 21st. We look forward to seeing everyone there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tully. Thank you, Dean. And thank everybody for participating. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you.